In 2013, I got my first miter saw, a small Einhell with an eight inch blade. Shortly after that, I upgraded to a 10 inch saw. And since then I've had two other miter saws in the workshop over the years. And to be honest, I never expected a day would come when I would decide that I might be better off without one. The mitre station I built in 2019 takes up a lot of space, but I designed it in a way so that I could fit other machines beneath it and other tools on top of it so that I would be using the space as efficiently as possible. But still, it hasn't been without compromises. When I'm using the table saw to make rip cuts to longer boards, the mitre station restricts my outfeed space. So the maximum lengths I'm able to rip are about 1.9 meters. It also means that I don't have space available for my planar thicknesser to be set up permanently. So at the moment I have to wheel it out, set it up into either planar or thicknesser mode. So I'd really like to just be able to walk up to my planar thicknesser and use it. Also when I'm working on projects, I'll often use the mitre station as a place to store things because any flat surface in the workshop always seems to get stuff piled up on top of it. And then I'll find myself wanting to use the mitre station again and I'll have to move everything off before I can cut a board. This particular mitre saw also has its rails at the back. Not a problem if you're moving this saw around on a job site, but if you've got it permanently set up in a workshop like me, it takes up a lot of depth and it sticks out. And on more than one occasion, I've collided with it and that can affect the accuracy of the saw too, which I'll come on to later in the video. There are mitre saws out there that take up less space, some with forward facing rails or folding arm style mechanisms, but generally tool manufacturers seem to design most of their tools more for job site use which I can understand because that's where the vast majority of them are used. It's well known that dust extraction on mitre saws is not very effective. And even though I've made every effort to collect the dust at source by having it hooked up to my dust extractor and building this enclosure to help contain the airborne dust so that it settles down in this passive dust collection drawer, I've still noticed that the level of dust particles in the air increase significantly, particularly if I'm using it for long periods of time. I've also noticed recently that on those projects where accuracy is really important, on a few occasions, I've made cuts on the mitre saw which have not given me satisfactory results. Let me try and demonstrate what I mean. So I've just set up the fence to cut a perfect 90 degrees and I can validate that by making a cut, flipping one half of the workpiece over and here you can see the two pieces meet together perfectly. But if I give the saw a bit of a knock, maybe accidentally bump into it slightly with a piece of timber or something, if I now change the angle and then revert back to 90 degrees and make a cut, you'll see that the cut is no longer accurate. So lately, if I've needed to make any cuts where accuracy is critical, I tend to make those cuts at the table saw using my panel cutting sled or cross cutting sled. And the mitre saw has pretty much been relegated just to cutting firewood or making cuts where accuracy is not critical. I've been using the Milwaukee mitre saw for three years now and I've never had any concerns with its accuracy or cut repeatability until recent months when I noticed the problem. So it definitely seems to be a fault that has developed over time. Those who are familiar with my channel will know that Milwaukee are a tool sponsor of the channel and it's very rare that I have anything negative to say about any of their tools. However, no tool is ever perfect and nothing is more important to me than the integrity of the channel. And I always try to point out why when a tool isn't working for me. With regard to the back running rails, they informed me that the sliding bar design was adopted by Milwaukee because it's the most robust to avoid bars flexing. Now, I know very little about the engineering of tools, so I'm happy to take their word on that. The accuracy cut repeatability problem, though, is not something that has been reported to them as an issue. In fact, they confirmed that generally it's been praised for its accuracy and robustness. They didn't stop there, though. They put me in touch with their product manager, who I had a call with, and he arranged to travel over to my workshop to have a look at the saw in person. And that happened a couple of weeks ago now, and I was really quite impressed that they cared enough to come and have a look at it. And it was also a great opportunity for me to be able to provide some feedback about some of the other Milwaukee tools to which they were really receptive. So we had a good look at the saw, he took some notes, and that's about all I know at this point in time. If I find out more in future, maybe I'll do some sort of follow up. If you watched the previous video on my channel, you'll know that I'm currently reorganizing my entire workshop, and I have a long list of things that I want to achieve from the new layout. I've already ticked off a few of those and removing the mitre saw and mitre saw station is going to help me to tick off a few more. I'll be able to maximize my table saw in feed and out feed space and free up more floor space. 
As I mentioned earlier, I have a crosscut sled and a panel cutting sled for my table saw, which I've been using a lot more recently for making accurate 90 degree cuts. And they've been working great, but I needed a solution for cutting angles. So I've spent some money on one of these. This is the Hongdui miter gauge. And I must be one of the few YouTube woodworkers who hasn't managed to get one of these for free, unfortunately. I've seen a lot of reviews and they are spoken about very highly. I'll leave some links to my favorite reviews of this product in the description box, as well as some links for where you can buy it. It's a beautiful thing and it exudes quality. It has incremental teeth at one degree spacings and stops for commonly used angles. You can tighten the machine screws on the bar to achieve a perfect fit in the miter slots with no side to side movement. And it really puts the miter gauges that come supplied with machines like this to shame, especially when it's such an easy problem to solve. These plastic washers simply expand when the machine screw gets tightened. It definitely isn't rocket science. I've also bought one of these. This is a fence rail, which I'm told will fit the Hongdui and is fully compatible. And it's an extending fence. It goes right up to about 1,235 millimeters. And it's got some flip flop stop blocks and things like that. The only trouble is these etched measurement markings are designed to go to the left of the table saw blade. And I wanted my miter gauge to work on the right hand side. And it's a bit of a shame that they haven't provided a stick on scale to give users that flexibility. There's also really not much space between the extending rail and the bigger part of the rail here. So I'm not sure if a self adhesive measurement tape is going to be able to fit here, but I bought some of those too. So let's find out. All right, that seems to fit really well. So that's good. All right now let's see if we can take this extending arm out and add it to the other side. With the knobs removed, I found a little grub screw that needed to be taken out to allow the extending rail to be installed to the other side. The next problem I found though was that only one end of the bar is tapped to accept the flipping stop block. The other end just has an untapped hollow hole. But I realized I could flip the rail upside down so that the original measurement scale was facing down instead of up so that I can make use of that tapped hole. Before I add the new measurement scales, I want to check that they're accurate, comparing it with a tape measure that I trust. I align the 10 millimeter markings and then check the 1000 millimeter markings and it looked close enough to me. I'm going to use this block of MDF measuring 290 millimeters long to set the position of the stop block. And I used a black marker pen to cover up the old markings since the new tape isn't as wide as the old scale and I don't want that old scale on show. Then I can align the 290 millimeter marking with the red pointer and stick it down. I set the fence to 200 millimeters and make a test cut and measure the cut to see how accurate it was set and it was a little bit off. But by loosening the knobs on the miter gauge and shifting the fence over by a fraction of a millimeter, I was able to dial it in perfectly with the next test cut, which measured a perfect 150 millimeters. I'm adding an off cut of the tape to the extending bar just to check it fits okay in there. And fortunately it does, that's a relief. And then I can set the tape on the extending rail using the same method, except this time I had to use a tape that reads from right to left rather than left to right. So now when I need to make a cut beyond 650 millimeters, I just need to align the measurement I want on the extending rail to where it meets the main fence, lock it down. And that allows me to use the stop block at the end of the extending rail for long repeatable cuts. The miter gauge is fully adjustable so that it can be tuned in to work perfectly with your machine. You can adjust the squareness of the fence to the table and the squareness of the fence to the blade. And getting it to cut a perfect 90 degree miter joint was no problem whatsoever. I'm pretty happy with this setup. I think along with the crosscut sleds, I now have everything I need to make accurate, reliable cuts. So I'll be honest, removing the miter saw and miter saw station has not been an easy decision. About a year ago, I made a video about why I ditched my MFT workbench top. And that was a much easier decision because I simply didn't use it and I haven't regretted getting rid of it at all. Getting rid of the miter saw though feels completely different. The only way I'll know for sure how I'll get by without one is to remove it from the workshop as if I leave it set up, force of habit and all that, 
And if I'm in the headspace of working on a project and just getting things done the quickest and easiest way, the temptation will always be to continue using it. And there's a chance that parting with the mitre saw won't work out for me. Maybe later down the line, I'll want to figure out a way of incorporating one back into the space I have, but I'm excited to find out. Stay tuned for the next video in this series, which is going to be all about reorganizing the space and creating a new layout. Thanks for watching.